name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Christos Anesti. Christos was crece. El Masiach Khan. Christo ha resucitado. En verdad ha resucitado. Christos ha enviat. God bless you all. Today, we just heard the, the passage in the, the, the Acts of the Holy Apostles that mentioned how it was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. And we have not a few, quite a few people in our parish that are from the Antiochian Orthodox Church from that tradition. Amen. And have had in some cases, generation after generation after generation of believing folks in their families, living in times of good, in good times and in times of severe persecution for centuries. And so truly when we hear the word of the Lord that others have labored and you have entered into their labors, this is true for us that we have entered into this way. From the earliest times, that's what Christian life was called. It was called the way. And so we have entered into this way that so many others were walking before us, preparing a path and opening a door. And so we give thanks to God for that. In today's Gospel reading, I wanted to highlight something that I had really never thought about before. And I was listening to a talk by Father Thomas Hofko. He picked up on this, and it's in other places as well. He says, you know, if you have a biblical mind, mind that's steeped in the scriptures, which apparently I don't, because <laughs> I didn't see this, I didn't think of this before. He says, whenever you see a well, and you see a man and a woman by a well in the Bible, he's like, it's going to make you think about married, about marriage. Why is that? Because when they are looking for a wife for Isaac, they find Rebecca at the well and they bring her back. When Jacob is looking for a bride. He encounters Rachel at the well. When Moses is, has fled out of Egypt and he's, he's out there on his own, he meets Zipporah at the well. And so Father Tom, of blessed memory, pointed out that he said, perhaps it's appropriate for us to think that what is going on here with the Word of God incarnate, God who has become incarnate to save humanity, is that when he goes to this well, when he meets the Samaritan woman, he is meeting his bride. What does that mean? He is meeting somebody that is a heretic, a sinner, you know what I mean, and somebody that's estranged from her society. And what does he do? And so this is something that Father Tom talked about. He said there are many signs that occur in the Gospel of John, like the multiplication of the loaves, the healing of the man that was born blind from birth. St. John Chrysostom talks about how it was his, he, he, he thinks that the man didn't even have any eyes when he was born, and that the Lord actually made eyes for him and put them into his, so that he could see. And so, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. He changes the water into wine. There's all of these different signs in the Gospel of John, but he said, this sign that occurs with this Samaritan woman, he said, is perhaps one of the most profound. That God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not counting men's sins against them. 
And so he finds his bride at the well. And, there's, and even the pattern of the story actually fits. Because what happens is the patriarchs, so Jacob or Isaac or these different folks, what would happen is they would meet the woman, right? And then the woman would go tell her family. And then the family would invite the suitor, the, the one who's to, to be wed to their daughter, to come and eat with them. And they would spend a few days together in order to kind of like develop their relationship with one another. And so what happens? The Samaritan woman meets Jesus and then immediately goes to the town and tells everyone, and then they come out to him and they're together for a few days, kind of sealing the deal. Father Tom also, he pointed out that it seems as if some of the earliest Christians that weren't among like the, the apostles themselves, the disciples who were, who were Jews, some of the earliest Christians after that were probably Samaritans. And these are people that, from the standpoint and perspective of the people of Israel, were irredeemable in their thinking and in their behavior. So it's a really beautiful thing to see in the passage today. And then, Think about the disciples come to the Lord and they've gone to get food. And he's weary and thirsty. But then when they bring him the food, he says, you know, he kind of says, no. I have food to eat which you don't know of. They're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he says, and he tells them, think about what he tells them to do. He says, because now the Samaritans are coming out to encounter the Lord. They're coming to see him and to hear his word, to hear his teaching, which is like the bread of life. So if they're gonna participate in some sort of communion and, and uh, union with one another, it's gonna be over the words of Christ himself. And so what does he say to the disciples? He says, we don't need any of the food that you brought. Lift up your eyes and look, the harvest is full. The harvest is white. Here it comes. This is the will of my Father, that all would be saved and that none would perish. So lift up your eyes and look, they are coming now. You're worried about eating something. Don't worry. Look. Here comes the food. Do the will of my Father in heaven so that you can be full, so that you can be full of life, so that you can be full of bread, so that you can be full of living water. And so it's a very beautiful passage. And I guess one last thing that struck me this morning when we were singing the hymns during Orthros was that when Jesus first speaks to the Samaritan woman, Right away, all of the reasons for division and for separation are immediately brought up. She says, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How is it that you, a Jew, are asking a drink from me? I'm a Samaritan. And it's rather, and the, this is why the disciples, they don't want to ask him, but they're kind of shocked that he's sitting and talking with a woman alone at the well because it's, it's inappropriate behavior. And she doesn't say that. She just mentions, why are you asking me? You know, as a Jew, why are you asking me these questions? Why are you asking me for anything? And what does the hymnody speaks about how the Lord diverted her. He diverted her attention from those things, it says, with sweet words. He got her off of what she was so hooked on and stuck on by using sweet words and by talking about water, by talking about life. I want you to see, I guess, a parallel there with what we experience today in our time and place and in our culture. There are many 
What you would, the, the real, the accurate term is, there are many ideologies, which means kind of these rigid, in, in a negative sense, you know, it's, it's these rigid systems of thought, prejudices that people develop against others, um, and they're reinforced. They're reinforced by the media that we consume. They're reinforced by the way that algorithms basically just give us a mirror. So we're, we're like narcissists, you know, he's like in love with staring at himself. And so we have a certain ideology and then we get him plugged into social media and that's all we see is ourselves over and over and over again. All of our fears, everything, all of our terrors. And we're just staring at ourselves all day long and thinking that we're learning something as well, even though we're just expanding like our own thoughts to ourselves. It's like this uh, solipsism, you know, caught in a circle. And so we have all this ideology. And so frequently it's the case, and I, I saw a recording of a homily by Father Paul. He was somebody I went to, we, we were in seminary together years ago. And he was talking with the, the people about how he says, you people, you people. <laughs> I don't think he said that. <laughs> he might have said, beloved brothers and sisters. <laughs> but, but, or he, or he said, you know, catechumens or people that are coming into the church. He said, they want me to really talk about politics and to get really involved in all this stuff and make that kind of the substance of my sermons. And they want all these answers about everything that's happening in society. Um, but he said, he's like, if that's what's drawing you into orthodoxy, he's like, you're gonna die. You're not gonna last. If this is the thing that's drawing you as something really negative, you like hate the, you, know, <laughs> you hate the world so much that you have to become orthodox. You know, <laughs> or you're, you're so upset about the, which I, you know, it's, it's relatively accurate to think about the, something like a kind of a, a collapse or at least a decline of Western civilization. Um, so people are so mad about that and their solution is to become orthodox. It's like, I don't think you guys, you know, are, are joining, jumping in the right boat. Um, but, so people do this, and they have this ideology that they get hooked on, and, and again, like with Father Paul, they're constantly pressuring him, like, you need to talk about this more. This needs to be the substance of your sermons. And he said, no way. He said, what you need to hear, what I need to hear, what everyone needs to hear, are the commandments of the gospel. The two chief ones, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and also to know all of the other commandments of the Lord that are about loving your neighbor, that are about turning the other cheek, that are about loving your enemy, that are about forgiving those who persecute you, praying for those who spitefully use you and abuse you, and genuinely seeking to repent and to actually pursue purity of heart before God. Because ultimately, that's all that matters. So he said, all of these other things are just distractions. And, and remember, so in saying all of that, what I'm getting at, I think, is the Lord diverted the Samaritan woman from all of those hang-ups with the sweetness of his word. He spoke to her in such a way that, that got her off of that hook. And at first, she's still not able to comprehend what he's saying. So he starts talking about living water, and she's like, I, I, do you have a bucket? Like, what? I don't understand. <laughs> um, and of course, you, you've heard the expression from the scriptures, taste and see. Taste first and then see. I think the Samaritan woman actually tastes the living waters, and that's why she forgets her water jar and just goes into the town and tells everyone about Jesus. So she's completely 
taken off of her obsession with, with the water. She's taken off of her obsession with, with the, the problems and the tensions and the difficulties between the Jews and the Samaritans at the time. All of that is forgotten. She's set free because of the word of the Lord. And so I think within our context, we need to strive to be people as well that when people come up to us and they're like, I'm so mad about the election, um, or whatever, to gently, with love, divert them with the sweetness of our words for their attention to be drawn to Jesus Christ, to the salvation that he brings, to life springing forth from the tomb, to repentance, to the pursuit of purity of heart, to love for enemies, to forgiveness, to all of these things. Amen. So that people aren't trapped. But it's a horrible place to be trapped. And I think we have a lot of um, uh, young men, I think in, in many of the Orthodox parishes throughout the country, there's a lot of young men that are converting or interested in orthodoxy and coming. And I do think that really rigid black and white ideology is like a young man's disease almost. Um, it's like I could almost compare it to a mental illness. And, and I've experienced, like I've been there. I was there. I know what it's like. Um, I went to college, you know, in my undergrad and I read all the books read all of the, the contrary, like, you know, um, radical, like, different philosophies and all of this stuff. Like, I did it. And ultimately, I had to learn to repent from it. Or at least try to. I don't think I really have, to a degree. Or at least I'm, I'm always tempted to, like, I'm doing it now. Um, <laughs> like, build a castle out of sand and things. You know. Look at this thing that I made. It's, you know. We try, try to impress people with the amount of books that you've read or the names that you can draw of philosophers that you're familiar with. Such a waste. So, I encourage you to speak to others sweetly about the beauty, the goodness, and the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And you will see them be set free. Amen. Amen.